Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock. I'm the executive director of the Humanist, of, of Humanist Learning Systems. <laughs> Almost went to a, a previous engagement I had. Um, I'm also the vice president of the USA chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association, who is the sponsor of this Lunch and Learn series. My co-host is Elizabeth Castillo. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm Elizabeth, a professor at Arizona State University, um, and I am the secretary of the International U.S. Humanistic Management Association. Welcome. So our guest today is Marie Charlot, and she works with people in the United States, Canada, and Asia, and she finds that we share basic human values and are committed to the same things, love, acceptance, abundance, and dignity. Her passion for people of any age and cultural background will not allow what is comfortable to supersede what is essential for their success. Marie is a catalyst who drives measurable transformation by providing others with new tools to be effective and thus maximize their potential. Mm -hmm. um, she's fluent in French and Creole. She graduated from SUNY Brooklyn with a BA in economics and psychology, followed by graduate courses. Uh, in her academic education, she was trained for a number of by a number of most effective leaders in transformational education. She's, uh, gosh, been on the radio. She's worked with major companies um, with their healing processes. She's worked with at-risk at youth and provides coaching. And she, once you hear from her, you're going to understand she's pretty awesome. So Marie, please talk to us about dignity and belonging in the workplace. In the workplace. Thank you, Elizabeth, for being here. Thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me. And thank you for such a beautiful introduction. Very nice. And then thank you all of you for being here and then really sharing with me what's possible. How can we move forward? What is the difference that we can make with people in bringing dignity in the world? Uh, Donna Hicks, one of my heroes, wrote Dignity, which is one of the New York Times bestseller. In her conversation in a podcast, she, she declared, that what we are dealing with in the world today is a bankruptcy in dignity. So the conversation for dignity is huge. And today I will just share with you as much as I can. And then um, I'm available to you. So thank you for being here. The most exciting breakthroughs of the 21st century will not occur because of technology, but because of an expanding concept of what it is to be human by John Nisbet. A feeling of worth is so important to people. Dignity not only explains an aspect of what it means to be human, but also it's the hallmark of our shared humanity. Everyone wants to be treated in a way that should that they matter. What does this common desire to be valued tell us about the human experience? Are we too dependent on others for the acknowledgement of our inherent value? How does an awareness of dignity influence our ability to lead people so that they recognize their own value and worth as well as the dignity of others. Our universal yearning for dignity drives our species and defines us as human beings. It is our highest common denominator, yet we know so little about it. It's hard for people to articulate exactly what it is. What do they know is more like an intuition or a sixth sense? Yes, dignity is important. People tell me, but they come up short when I ask them to put their intuition into words. A new model of dignity. Dignity is an internal state of peace that comes with the recognition and acceptance of the value and vulnerability of all living things. The dignity model, what is the dignity model? It is an approach to help people understand the role that dignity plays in our lives and our relationships. It is my response to what I observe to be a missing link in our understanding of conflict, our failure to recognize how vulnerable human beings are to being treated as if they did not matter. It explains why it hurts when our dignity is violated and it gives us the knowledge, the awareness and skills to avoid unknowingly harming others. It demonstrates how to rebuild a relationship that has broken under the weight of conflicts 
and suggest what to do to reconcile. The motto is my response to the elephant that is always in the room. When relationship breaks down, it names the elephant dignity violator. It takes effort to learn how to honor the dignity of others, which significantly enhances the experience of being in a relationship. A good relationship feels good, but one in which both parties recognize and acknowledge each other's value and worth feels even better. Without the drag that threats place on a relationship, both parties feel free to extend themselves to each other to open up. This is the opposite of being on guard. With safety comes the freedom to welcome intimacy and genuine connection. The model teaches an appreciation of what we are all up against as human beings in our search for dignity. We learn how to honor it in everyday interactions with loved ones as well as strangers, how to maintain our own dignity by fighting the internal forces that tempt us to act badly and how to resolve conflicts and reconcile with people by recognizing their inherent worth. In the end, the message of the model is quite simple. Demonstrate the care and attention for yourself and others that anything of value deserve. That is the first and only imperative. Don't miss an opportunity to, expert, to exert the power you have to remind others of who they are, invaluable, priceless, irreplaceable. And by the way, remind yourself of that too. The difference between dignity and respect. Dignity is different from respect. Dignity is a birthright. Treating others with dignity is the baseline for our interaction. We must treat others as if they matter as if they are worthy of care and attention. According to the philosopher Kent, recognizing the dignity of all human beings means that it is unethical to exploit other people or treat them merely as instruments to further on goal and interest. Honorary, honoring the dignity of others has nothing to do with any of their unique qualities or accomplishments. Although I agree that all human beings deserve to have their humanity respected, human beings often behave in ways that are harmful to others, making it difficult to respect them for what they have done. Treating people badly for what they have done, that they have done something wrong, only perpetuate the cycle of indignity. What is worse, we violate our own dignity in the process. Others' bad behaviors do not, doesn't give us license to treat them badly in return. Their inherent value and worth need to be honored no matter what they do, but we don't have to respect them. They must earn respect to their behaviors and action. Earning respect means doing something to earn respect. We have extended ourselves to others in an admirable way. Walking out of the prison of Robben Island in South Africa after being held there as political prisoners for 27 years, Nelson Mandela announced that he had no anger towards his captors. This extraordinary act deserved respect. He earned it. The evolutionary roots of dignity. To fully grasp the meaning and significance of dignity, let me put the concept into a perspective that encompasses what it means to be a human being. One of the defining characteristics of humanity is that we are feeling beings. We are equipped with five senses with which we experience others and the world around us. And we can easily affect how others feel. In fact, we have a remarkable impact on one another. With the discovery of mirror neurons, Scientists now know something even more remarkable. We are hardwired to feel what others are feeling without, say, without having to say a word. Other scientists have demonstrated human connection is crucial for survival. This new evidence that biologically connects us to one another is consistent with what many scholars of human development have argued for decades. 
that we are more than just individual entities hardwired for individual survival, that we are social beings that grow and flourish when our relationships are intact. Our survival is inextricably linked to the quality of our relationships and our growth and development occur in the context of our relationships. Judith Jordan and Linda Hartling argue that growth fostering relationships are a central human necessity. What seems to be of the utmost importance to human is how we feel about who we are. We long to look good in the eyes of others, to feel good about ourselves, to be worthy of others' care and attention. We share our longing for dignity, the feeling of inherent value and worth when we feel worthy, when our value is recognized, we are peacefully, sorry, we are peacefully happy. When a mutual sense of worth is recognized and honored in our relationships, we are connected. A mutual sense of worth also provides the, safe, the safety necessary for both parties to extend themselves, making continued growth and development possible. We have an inborn desire to be treated well because we are psychologically programmed to believe that our lives are dependent on it. We cannot help but react to being mistreated. Our emotional radar is set at a very low threshold for indignities. The second we sense that someone is judging us or treating us unfairly, or as if we are inferior, the emotional warning signal flashes on. Research suggests that we are just as programmed to sense a threat to our dignity, to our sense of worth, as we are to our physical threats. So thus what appear to exist side by side with the human desire for dignity is an opposing tension, our obvious vulnerability. Although we are precious and invaluable beings, our dignity can be violated very quickly, just as our lives can be ended in the blink of an eye, we are just as vulnerable to feeling un, uh, unworthy as we are to feeling worthy. Because of the primacy of relationships, our sensitivities to others and the world leave us open to injury of all sorts, ultimately to the possibility of death. It appears that the feeling of loss is at the heart of human vulnerability, the loss of dignity, the loss of connection to others and the loss of life itself. The human experience of worth and vulnerability is fundamentally emotional. It emanates from one of the oldest part of our brain from what neuroscientists call the limbic system. When we sense that our worth is being threatened, we are flooded with dread and shame with destabilizing feelings that are painful and aversive. Most of us will do just that about anything to avoid these dreaded feelings, which are parts and parcel of an injury to dignity. When we experience harm, our self-preservation instincts are very strong, inciting feelings of humiliation, rage, and self-righteous revenge. Some humans who have experienced chronic violation of dignity have even gone to the extreme of taking their own lives to bring an end to this intolerable feelings. Other goes to the, to the opposite extreme by killing those who cause the injury. This highly sensitive aspect of humanity, our vulnerability to being violated by others serve a critical though odd function. It promotes our survival. It warns us when danger is imminent. When someone or something threatens us, it tells us to take action to eliminate the threat. Our self-protective instincts are prime for safety, making us ready to either fight or withdraw in the service of self-preservation. Our desire for dignity has ancient evolutionary roots. Evolutionary biologists know a lot about these deep drives that explains so many of our behaviors, survival behaviors that we inherited from our ancestors. 
these behaviors stem from the, from the quest to survive. And this aspect of human nature propels us throughout our lives. Some call this aspect of our human nature instincts, since they seem to automatically and unconsciously guide us towards what to seek and what to avoid. Importantly, however, we also have the power within us to make different choices about how we react to instincts. More recently, in the story of human development, another part of our brain, the neural cortex, evolved, enabling us to manage our self-protective reaction. The limbic system in our brain that prompts the fight or flight reaction and the attended emotion promotes survival in another way and encourages humans to get closer to one another, to connect. France de Waal claims that connection is part of human biology, that human beings are hardwired to connect with one another because connection helps us feel free, feel safe rather than vulnerable. Um, briefly, according to Donna Hicks, the 10 essential elements of dignity are acceptance of identity, inclusion, safety, acknowledgement, recognition, fairness, benefit of the doubt, understanding, and dependence, accountability. I would like to have a brief conversation about belonging and inclusion. Belonging leading within a culture of dignity. Is it true that leadership is in a state of crisis? Are we really waiting to be rescued? As Elizabeth Samet warned us, have we failed to develop the kind of internal confidence it takes to claim the fountain of power that John Adams told us we needed to secure and then use wisely to improve our social conditions? I believe that yes, we have neglected to live up to that leadership challenge. Other leadership experts are even more convinced that there is a crisis, but for different reasons. Standard professors Jeffrey Pfeffer, author of Leadership BS, argued that the entire leadership industry is not delivering the kind of outcomes and behaviors in our leaders one might expect, given the time, the energy, the resources spent on training, leadership development seminars, books, and blogs. Inclusion is engagement within a community where the equal worth and inherent dignity of each person is honored. An inclusive community promotes and sustains a sense of belonging. It affirms the talent, the beliefs, the backgrounds, and ways of living of its members. Inclusion is not a strategy to help people fit into the system and structures which exist in our society. It is about transforming those systems and structures to make it better for everyone. Inclusion is about creating, creating a better world for everyone. This is by Diane Rickler. During his Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1964 explained the importance of bringing positive energy to facilitate positive change. Inclusion is about shared vision. Engaging members of a group in a shared vision is a key component of transformational leadership. When applied intentionally, this is an approach that causes change in both the individual and social system. As such, a shared vision is essential for a group of people to change from who they are to who they want to be. It offers a possibility of a common identity that requires people to first find their starting point by looking inward to assess their current identities, their values and beliefs. From that existing state, the vision provides clarity of purpose and directions. Without a shared vision of who or what to be, there's no clear guidance for what people should be doing or what justice and healings look like. If we are truly serious about real and positive change for equity, educational equity, we need to center our energy on the positive vision we want to create. 
the response to change is inclusion. We say inclusion by changing our culture to ensure all people feel that they belong, not in spite of their differences, but because of them. In the process, everyone is honored and feels welcome, not by accident, but by design. Inclusion is about people partnering with one another to change the culture so that everyone experiences access and unconditional belonging. That's a different paradigm from expecting people to change themselves in order to fit in. Inclusion requires us to let go of who we are so we can become who we need to be. In other words, inclusion requires transformation. How educators can think and act strategically to get our desired results. The transformation itself requires who we become to make the change. Belonging or being fully human means more than having access. Belonging entails being respected at a basic level that includes the right to both create, co-create, and make demand on society by John Powell. According to Maslow, belonging is essential. We define belonging as the extent to which people feel appreciated, validated, accepted, and treated fairly within an environment, school, classroom, or work. To redress inequity and create a socially just system of education, ensuring access is not enough. For educational equity, access and belonging are both vital. The need to belong precedes the need to achieve. Humans have a hierarchy of needs. Belonging provides a foundational context of relationship and community that support the pursuit of achievement. Fundamentally, the structures and tradition of US schools, however, requires that students achieve in order to belong an inversion of the relationship between these two human needs. This unjust system harm people, producing numerous casualty that include dropout rates, anxiety, suicide, gangs, conformity, negativity, exhaustion, and self-segregation. When people are concerned about not fitting in or being unwelcome, this belonging uncertainty hinders academic performance and contributes to what is known as the achievement gap. Historically, marginalized identity groups are more vulnerable to the stereotype, threat, and belonging uncertainty when aspired to achieve in the dominant culture. Because belonging is such a self-evident concept, we have to ask ourselves, why are we not prioritizing it? We must interrogate our complicity in the educational inequity machine. Belonging is one key to successful equity, implementation, inclusion, and dignity are the other keys. According to Maslow hierarchy, safety physiological precedes being safety. Safety precedes belonging. Belonging precedes achievement. Achievement precedes self-actualization. Dignity is loved. Dignity is an act of love. Dignity is a commitment. A commitment to what? A commitment to life, to humanity, transformation. And then I would like to complete with a beautiful quote that I cannot seem to find right now. And the quote that I was referring to, and you can all, you all probably already know it, is the quote by um, um, Nelson Mandela our deepest fear. So with that, I declare my contribution complete and the floor is open. Uh, I wanna thank everyone for, for participating today. This has been a, a program of the International Humanistic Management Association. And um, if you found this helpful, we hope you'll join as a member and support our work. <laughs>